Holy Summerween Trickster Batman. Tiki here. Watching through Batman, the animated series, for the first time. It's so far from season four, it's been a big fun, but a little underwhelming. We've got some crazy Mr. Freeze spider heads here and there, but you know, I just suffice to say, I think it's kind of like really stood out from some of the stronger episodes of the first three seasons. But then we come upon one. And is it possible, Dragon, that this episode is not just uh, not just easily the best of season four, but one of my favorites we've talked about? Well, Dragon, we'll just have to find out. Tell them why we're here. Well, you see, folks, long ago, I made a vow. A vow to educate Tiki in the ways of Batman the Animated Series, serving as his spirit guide to Gotham, in a way. That's right. And Dragon, you're going to kill me, but I don't have the name of... I have the name of that episode written down, but not this episode. I'm so sorry. What are we talking about? It's probably, I assume, it has something to do with fear, right? Never fear or something. Never fear. I got it right. I'm a good tiki. Tonight we're talking about never fear. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. You want uh, to do it again? No, I don't want to do it again, No. All right. They're fine. They're fine. So, Dragon, something to say, this one was a home run for me. Uh, I really, really dug this one. I, I thought that just pacing-wise, it was really on point. It had some, like, some real uh, kind of Looney Tunes humor at the start of it. The middle of it was kind of like a nice Batman, Tim Drake adventure. And then the third act was uh, a lot of pathos, a lot of like, oh, man, like, Tim Drake's really, you know, kind of kind of morally right here like batman is you know it really is one of the uh one of the furthest slides we see batman take throughout the show thus far like it's, it's the closest I, i'd say definitively dragon this is the closest we've seen batman coming to killing someone in the show thus far would you say that's accurate i would say that's accurate yes so something to say dragon i feel like this episode has a little bit of everything like i said it's got humor it's got detective work it's got you know legitimate pathos and to speak to my holy dragon, it's got a scarecrow that feels like something out of Gravity Falls, man. That scarecrow redesign, um, it's not quite what we've seen so far, but I love it, and it's easily my favorite scarecrow design of the show, dragon. It's, uh, it's definitely probably my favorite redesign out of, out of everything we've seen in season four so far. Yeah, Never Fear is a real special one. Uh, again, in the first, kind of this first batch of episodes of New Adventures, they, uh, again, I think they kind of, they start pretty strong, uh, albeit, I mean, you scratch my back. Again, it's a, it's a big Nightwing episode, it's kind of the bigger takeaway, but the point being, uh, you know, Never Fear is kind of one of the, uh, one of the Hall of Famers, uh, for sure. And there, there, don't know, there are some, still some big, iconic ones to come from New Adventures, and we haven't even gotten to something like, uh, we'll say, like an Over the Edge or a Mad Love yet, but there's, a uh, there's some big ones coming, but I've, I I like to think is I don't think some people talk about over the edge before they talk about never fear. Never fear doesn't get brought up nearly enough because this uh -huh. one is uh, is quite special and pretty much for the reasons you said. I think you're pretty on the money that this is uh, this one's pretty special. And again, a big Tim Drake standout for me. This is probably my favorite Tim Drake episode personally. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh, let me let me kind of go through the credits on this. So the uh, director was uh, we had a top, we had a great crew uh, on on the uh, kind of a great duo of director and writer here. We had the director uh, Kenji uh, Hachizaki, who is uh, who is uh, from Superman the Animated Series. He did uh, one of the great episodes, The Late Mister Kent, which I love that episode. You've seen that episode even? Ah, uh, you sparked my memory about it. Okay, that's the one where uh, Cl uh, Clark Kent gets killed, but not really, and he has to solve his own... Oh, work. sure, sure. It's basically like the perchance to dream of the Superman animated series, right? Pretty much, uh, pretty much. Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. And uh, we had the writer from that episode as well. So both of them are kind of making their Batman debuts here in this in this episode, and they're both doing an excellent job. We have the writer. The writer is a big standout. The writer is Stan Berkowitz. Stan Berkowitz, he did get it working out, kind of got his break on Superman, and he basically Stan Berkowitz keeps coming back by the time we get the you know all the way to Justice League Unlimited. This guy, he's uh, he's one of the top tier guys. He adapted, uh, I believe, he was uh, one of the guys who adapted Justice League: The New Frontier with my with my pal Dave Bullock in the director's chair. So it's uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I love it. Berkowitz is great. Um, all right, okay, the studio worked on this. Now, Tiki, we keep... Now, for a change, it's not Coco. Oh, my God. So, again, as I mentioned, Coco is trying to emulate a style for the show. And that style, in this case, is TMS, baby. We have the original TMS in the chair on this one. Is that, TMS. Why, is that Scarecrow so distinct? Yes, that's why this episode looks so good, and pretty much is why, like, especially our, our more thrilling, our more kind of action packed, like, kind of morally kind of on the edge of your seat scene, which is look as intense as they do later on. So, TMS, just in the animated series alone, like, they're some of their claims to fame uh, Two Face Part One, which is a work of art, uh, Demon's Quest, which one of my favorites of two parters, and uh, most famously, the thing they really kind of made a splash with, the thing everyone talks about to this day, the thing kind of put TMS on the map as an animation studio in many respects, at least as far as Batman's concerned, Feet of Clay. Uh, Feet of Clay Part 2 specifically. You remember of the course. whole clay face transformation? That's TMS's, that's the big feather in TMS's cap. So again, the idea is like, with the whole change in style, their best case scenario is that they would look like TMS every episode. And again, lo and behold, you have an episode actually done by TMS. So the, you get the full effect of the revamp in this episode is my point. Gotcha. So speaking of the revamps, just to talk about the, the Scarecrow Bill. So we have, um, so the revamp allowed for the biggest redesign, uh, at least at the very least successful redesign. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the Scarecrow, because you have Joker on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have the Scarecrow kind of equally as, as well, more so... Yeah, the, Joker the, they toned down, and Scarecrow they just, like, went full tilt edgy with it. That's the thing, Scarecrow is de definitely, he's the biggest redesign, Joker's just kind of more, most kind of, like, ill, infamous redesign. Scarecrow is, uh, Bruce Tim took a look at Scarecrow. And he saw that, you know, the, the, the problem is every time, if you look in the animated series, almost every time we do the Scarecrow, we alter his design. Because he mm -hmm. went from, I like the first version, because it's in the whole famous, you know, I am Vengeance, I am, I am Batman, with the whole, I uh, believe it's uh, nothing to fear in that one. And uh, in that one, you know, he had pretty much like, you know, the like kind of baghead Scarecrow. And then we have like the one with like the little uh, hay for hair, and, like the big old jack-o'-lantern face and the mouth and everything. Yeah, I'm not design. a fan of the one where he has like a more personified mouth. Yeah, that's the thing. So the idea is that they're trying to make him a little more scary, which is difficult because, again, you have to make him look like a scarecrow, which is cool, but not exactly scary. <laughs> and uh, then, again, so they're kind of pushed that. So uh, just make no mistake to you, this is the first time ever we've made the scarecrow look like this. It's like a very original look for the show and everything. Like, he's always been kind of like in, like, we give him a pitchfork usually. That's as much as we do with him in the comics, <laughs> traditionally. I mean, the, cl the most we've ever pushed it was Long Halloween, which is, I mean, again, it's pretty much that second design I was talking about, but just a little creepier. Anyway, so, um, so yeah, well, basically we kind of took influence from uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, yeah. And uh, the big the big thing was that we gave him a noose around his neck. It's going to make him look like he was kind of, basically kind of made him look like he was a preacher who was, he was uh, hanged and then cut down. Oh, God. <laughs> and the big thing that kind of tied it all together is they got a new voice for the Scarecrow. They got uh, the incomparable Jeffrey Combs to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, Scarecrow. You know, you're, are you familiar with the reanimator at all? Yeah, you know, Jeffrey Combs' name sounds familiar. I'm not familiar with the reanimator, though. Yeah, we we saw him in Gotham once. He, they got him for uh, for the uh, not the doll maker, not doll mocker, but doll mocker's like Stooge, the one with the whole fish moony thing, the one that all like, he got sewn together all creepily. That guy. Oh God! Right, right. Basically, fake doll mocker. Memorable right. turn there. The point being, Combs he's very known in horror circles for reanimator, but the big role he's known for after this, this kind of gets him to, is the question in the DC universe. People love him as the voice of the question. He's awesome as the question. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, so. Basically, Combs reflects the new look with the creepy voice, gets the question years later, and um, and let's see, um, last thing here, so uh, one more thing with the Scarecrow's design, so Ty Templeton, so they never explain why the heck the Scarecrow looks this way, in case you're curious, they never explain what the heck happened <laughs> in universe. I just why kind of went with it. But Ty Templeton, who I had the pleasure of meeting once, he actually, uh, you know, he kind of uh, looked into it, Ty Templeton in an interview said once that he... Uh, he was eyeing to do a story in the tie-in comics. Remember, like, all the stuff, Mr. Freeze, the tie-in comics yeah. become a little more important. Um, he was going, he wanted to do a story explaining the Scarecrow's look, um, where the idea is the uh, Scarecrow, he kind of, he, he, he got the, he didn't get the insanity plea for a change during one of his crimes, and he was extradited out of Gotham, I believe. And he got the death penalty, which was by some weird kind of, like, you know, kind of loophole, was going to be the hang, he basically was hanged, but it was botched. 
and uh, kind of gave him like this kind of this misnomer that he was kind of supernatural when he really wasn't. He's lucked out. Oh God, <laughs> that's crazy. And there have been some other takes, like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series tie-in comic, where they basically they show the Scarecrow wants to after meeting the Ninja Turtles, he was scared straight. I gotta I gotta be scary to scare this weird turtle thing. So basically, he comes up with this design. Mm -hmm. So there's there's some fun like this. In case anyone's curious, if anyone take whatever you want from it, folks. Otherwise, Scarecrow's got got a face look, got a new costume. He looks creepy. He looks he barely you can tell barely there's a guy in that costume. All right. So all that said, let's uh, dive into it. All right, so we start with a very, uh, you know, a very populated Gotham City, which is something we don't usually see. It's kind of like the downtown sort of epicenter. It's like almost like a Times Square esque location. Yes, Gotham Square, which we saw in the New uh -huh. Year's, uh, the New Year's short and holiday nights. Gotcha, gotcha. I believe, basically so, minus the stage. So we see a shadow swooping across the buildings, dragon, and uh, I love the excitement. It's almost like, you know, dare I dare I say it's almost like Santa Claus, you know, <laughs> like seeing Santa or something like that. It's like, hey, to it it's him. him. Right, right. And uh, I, I just love this little comedic beat, dragon, that sets things off so well, the tone of the first act here where uh, uh, the kid's like, who is it, Mommy? Oh, it's Batman, honey, and then the guy, like, crashes through the neon sign. Uh, maybe it's not him. I love the neon oh. signs, which, again, I think Schumacher went a little crazy with, but still, the neon was cool, though. Neon's pretty cool. Uh-huh. Um, so, again, very di basically, it's like a natural way of doing Dick Sprang stuff, where we can't have necessarily giant props. We can have j big old neon signs to kind of evoke that, like all the giant props and everything. <laughs> Yeah, but so. yeah, so we revealed that it's not Batman. That is a large man uh, who's kind of like this thrill seeker, a uh, voice by. I don't know if you did you catch did, did you pick up on who did the voice of this guy? Uh, this is gonna be awesome. Okay, so this is uh, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. Alfred did the voice of this guy. Oh no way! Yeah, seriously. Ephraim, again, it's the whole it's the old the old tradition. I I still I never put a catch dragon. That's, remember, that's three, awesome. an actor can do three voices and get paid uh -oh. for the same role. So again, Zimbalist uh, sometimes he does multiple voices. This is a very memorable case of him doing a really. <laughs> doing a really out there you know, kind of voice <laughs> like oh god he's so he's almost unrec he's almost unrecognizable right oh yeah absolutely so we have uh, this the large thrill seeker batman robin Taylor, because okay that's a little off we should probably look into that uh <laughs> the man he, he hits the arm of this giant neon sign which uh falls until uh and, ba and uh, basically he and the, he and the sign fall uh, he he kind of catches the edge of this building. Uh, again, I, I love this. I love the build up here. This man's not screaming as he's falling to his death or panicking or anything. He's just like, "Wee!" and then he catches the side. Yeah, he's just totally all in on the adrenaline. I just love. I just love the clues here that something's amiss with this guy, and like you can kind of pick up on it. He's not afraid. You know, it's kind of in the, it's it's the seeds are being planted. So, the arm uh, takes down some power lines, which threatens the pedestrians below. Batman and Robin they they grapple a little safety net to catch the sign, save the people. Batman saves Mister Thrill Seeker, and uh, then uh, Batman tries talking the man to a window very calmly. I love me. I love me some Batman saving people, but then Batman's just kind of baffled by this inner exchange and i love it which is like okay listen there's a window be uh, behind you just take a few steps there and you'll get in there oh i'm not going in this is the best night of my life <laughs> could also be the last oh come on there's something to be afraid of the fears of prison you see and i've just broken out does a little jig even uh, <laughs> <laughs> literally the dragon, I'm this, is, this moment like, just makes me I've seen this moment, like, three times, and it makes me laugh out loud every time. Like, after the little jig, he just, like, pushes Batman off the side of the village, like, tag! Oh, God, it's just, that's what I'm saying. It's just, it's it's crazy adrenaline-type stuff here. He's, like, knocks him off, and then Batman grapples the two of them to, grabs two of them to safety. Uh, basically, we see this guy's a nut. So, a <laughs> very intriguing opening, I felt, wouldn't you say? Well, like I said, it's intriguing, and it's also very kind of Looney Tunes comedic at the same time. That's what I like about it. Yeah, but with that edge of, like, there's something really kind of scary and off about this. But again, it's like, oh, man, this guy's, look how silly this guy is, but, you know, almost killing people. Mm -hmm. Not intentionally, though. All right. 
So let's see. So then we have uh, okay. So there's a man in the crowd. It's like yay, battle the crowd's like ah, look at Batman save that crazy guy we thought was Batman earlier. Look at that guy. <laughs> so we we have a man in the crowd who returns uh, to his shadowy boss, uh, basically breaking the news that they lost the the subject to Batman. Then we reveal essentially we're still building him up, but we kind of in shadow we we kind of build up the scarecrow. My God, just hearing Jeffrey Combs' voice and just the silhouette of the scarecrow, this big old preacher hat. It's awesome. Oh yeah, it's great. <laughs> I, I know you're not familiar with this franchise, Dragon, but it's like something out of Jeepers Creepers. Yeah. All right. I believe it. Next day. Uh, well, real quick, just the, one of the creepy lines uh, he has here is just, like, we, you know, he, he, basically this guy's been providing Scarecrow with test subjects. Like, what's the point of providing you with test subjects if you're going to lose them? So, uh, you know, he wants to he wants to operate in the shadows until he's ready for his big plan, which we're going to see in Act Three and kind of gilding the lily for for Act Three. Uh, you know, doesn't want to doesn't want to doesn't want to give himself up uh, quite yet. We don't want to give ourselves away. Do we just building up kind of the uh, we're building up one this guru character who's going to have a big role in the episode as well as just kind of okay, okay Scarecrow is pulling this guy's strings and he he's got a, a dastardly plan in the works. Mm-hmm. Let's go, Wayne Enterprises, Tiki. Thanks there. All right, so Dragon, this is uh, this is another scene that I just thoroughly appreciate. Just Bruce Wayne, just totally in business mode. Dragon, dare I say this might be one of the most mundane Bruce Wayne scenes that we've ever gotten? Oh yeah, we get a couple of these scenes in New Adventures. Seeing Bruce Wayne's day to day, you know, it's kind of well, what is what is life at Wayne Brush <laughs> like, for Bruce Wayne? <laughs> So he's returned to the office. His assistant Sarah is telling him, you know, he's got, uh, you know, like one of the clerks uh, has been demanding. Uh, Sarah, with him. Uh, right. Sorry, I can resist. So uh, Seymour Gray is the man's name. Uh, Seymour Gray, usually quite a quiet guy, which is, is kind of a you know, out, out of sorts here. This is kind of weird. Like why this guy's kind of being like, I demand to see the boss, the namesake boss, not Lucius Fox, the other guy. <laughs> so uh, he also kind of reveals that hey, someone's in your office, and he says, "Let me guess, this is it's Tim Drake in his office, uh, having in the midst of summer vacation." Uh, <laughs> of course, Batman has, he has no idea about summer vacation. I mean, yeah, I love Batman start, dealing with like a great kind of Father's Day episode, Dragon. I dare I say. Exactly. That man dealing with the struggles of, again, it's been years since, he, since he's had to deal with this sort of thing. Dick Grayson might have been homeschooled for all we know. It's just like these are these are different, you know, again, bat dad scenarios here are quite fun. Which, again, <laughs> look how casual they are compared to where they go by Act 2 in this episode. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Such, exactly. such a journey. Such a journey. So uh, 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 Tim Drake's asking about Tarzan guy. And we learn he had uh, acrophobia, which uh, is kind of basically the opposite of, <laughs> which is basically the opposite of, of, of Dick Grayson, <laughs> where uh, you know he is uh, he was afraid of fr- desperately afraid of heights and acrobatics and things of the such, uh, and and because um, basically before they can ponder things further, they are interrupted by Mister Gray, Seymour Gray, bursting through. How does this scene go? <laughs> You can't silence me anymore, Mr. Wayne. I've got ideas. Ideas that are going to revolutionize cost accounting. (laughs) Mr. Gray, I presume. Yeah, that's right. Mousy Mr. Seymour Gray. Been at the same desk for 18 years. Afraid to to say anything. Afraid of losing my job. So you know, Sarah's trying to mediate here. She's trying to apologize. So she says, "Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wayne. He just slipped through him. I'm call- I've called secure." Now I love how professional Bruce Wayne is in this scene. You know, he's how he's handling Grace. He's like, oh, "Mr. Yeah. Gray, that was not a really great time." Uh, and says, "He says, oh, trying to intimidate me, which he's not trying to do at all." She says, <laughs> like, "I quit." So he quits, and before he leaves, he kisses poor Sarah, which. I mean, look, it ain't PC now, but it's still the idea wasn't pre- it wasn't PC then. I'm in then. the phone book, baby. I'm in the phone book. I mean, that to me just kind of sells the, mo- the moment in spite of it not being really PC, just because that's such a pathetic pickup line. But again, clearly he's again clearly he's on something, so you know it's <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's. Um... Basically, I just love the guy. Out of all the mountains he he, he picked to die on, he picks cost accounting. <laughs> right, right. Oh, God. Anyways, the security holds him. I'm in the phone book, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so in the aftermath of the outburst, uh, Batman, uh, Bruce finds uh, a card in Gray's wallet, uh, which says, Never fear. Which, again, episode namesake, pretty good tie-in. Oh, yeah. 
All right, so then we transition to the Never Fear seminar, led by the guru, basically the guy, in the, the big guy, with the big chin, the white suit, the guru. All right, Dragon, you're going to have to remind me of the name of the villain from Dexter Season 5, because he really reminds me of this guy. Uh, okay, here's the thing. I know the actor who played him. Johnny Lee Miller, yeah. yeah. Johnny Lee Miller, you, you know, went on the You don't remember the name of the character, though. I, I mean, it's not Tiki. I think we all know it's not the best season, I mean. No, it's a Google search away. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> See, I know the actress who played all these Dexter villains off the top of my head, but I can't quite, can't quite place. Uh... <laughs> it, 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 it just he very much reminds me of the Take It guy. I remember, like his, I remember he had this big, his big shtick, and Dexter was the whole like, uh, you hear that tick, tick, tick? That's your life. That's your life ticking away, or something like. You okay, honestly, out. Dragon, I didn't even get far enough into. The, I quit like halfway through that season. Jordan Chase, that's the one. Yeah, Jordan. yeah. Now I, I hear the chase. The chase is like, yeah. Now, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, there is like a Jordan Chase sort of vibe here. Very much again, like kind of the uh, one of these like you know motivational speaker seminar sort of things, like the self improvement kind of seminar kind of guys here. Uh -huh. The guru. He's basically giving the sales pitch of banish the limitation of fear uh, from your lives. Which uh, again, a little I got to tell you, watching this after all the all the Nexium you know documentary, a little Nexium esque, which got to Nexium, it's all about the whole, like, you know, basically get rid of all your anxiety and your, your self-doubt and just, like, go for life. So that's pretty much, it's kind of similar to the sales pitch, just eliminate this feeling. But, like, it's all an <laughs> illusion within the mind's prison, that whole thing. So what I like of... about it, Dragon, is that, like, through the episode, it's like, it does frame it as being dangerous, but by the same time, it also kind of frames it as a little bit of a superpower as well. It almost kind of has like an M. Night Shyamalan Unbreakable verse vibe to it, right? That's a, that's a good call, yeah. Yeah, good yeah, yeah. So we reveal... Um... So we reveal uh, the lazy redesign. I got to admit, we I, I'll talk up the Scarecrow's design, but like, there's a lazy redesign of Matches Malone, where basically Bruce Wayne's Matches Malone, which we've seen in you the anime. Matches Malone is so fun that I don't care, Dragon. No, here's the thing. Here's, here's the frustrating thing, okay? Here's the I, I I shouldn't have a problem with this. It's just always when I watch this episode, like the one thing, because... There's, in the comics, they kind of put it. They use this guy again as like full on matches Maloney. But again, you know, you put him in the black suit, it's fine. When you realize, oh yeah, in the anime in, in the show, we can't change up Bruce Wayne's wardrobe like we could in the comic. Uh -huh. So he basically, if anyone just looked, oh, it's Bruce Wayne with a mustache and sunglasses. So you know, it's <laughs> it's we didn't even give him the match in this, but he's pretty much it's like this is what the matches Malone get up is. Right, right. It just—it's like pretty much like literally the mustache comes off later. It's like really, it's like very. It's—it's it's like the whole joke. We couldn't change the Joker suit in that one episode. It looks the same guy. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But that, but I, I, I hear it though. It's the point being, Bruce Wayne's undercover. Take it for what you will. He's undercover. He sneaks into uh, sneaks into an office. Uh, as the crowd kind of takes the bait, he picks a lock on a cabinet, finds it full of canisters of. Uh, he finds finds a whole bunch of gas canisters and as he finds it he's knocked out by the scarecrow and his big scary staff he traded the scythe for a staff because he doesn't need the blade he doesn't need the he doesn't you don't need like a little scarecrow in a field with a little force <laughs> exactly that's what i'm saying like we, we gave him the scythe to overcompensate we don't need to do that anymore it's giving like Dragon, a, the a noose staff. there's two things about it the noose obviously is like the big visual thing but then the thing that's even more disquieting, and I'll kind of repeat this, is the fact that his face doesn't have a lot of expression to it. Because it, it's within darkness, that's the thing. Uh -huh. like, well, not just the fact that, it, yeah, it, it, like, within darkness every time you see it, yeah. I am saying, like, you see no way a human person could be in that mask. Exactly, it's exactly. Like that's, it's kind course. of got this, like, weird, like, uncanny quality to it. Like, the weird details, like, his hands are all corpsey and, like, cat, you know, kind of like cadaver-esque. It's really... Uh -huh. All right, so, uh, Matches, uh, Matches awakens at uh, the Gotham Zoo, which, again, locations this season, man. Locations. We go all over the place. We explore a lot of Gotham this, this season. Right. <laughs> I mean, don't worry, I know we've been to the zoo technically with the man bat. I mean, we're going all, we're not just going to the generic, like, you know, like the one section of the zoo. No, it's need cool, to be. it's cool, yeah. They're going, uh, so anyway, so we show off the red skies of the revamp really well here as well. Uh, you know, we, we have this jump scare bit as matches comes to a uh, giant. Hey, it's not, gator land. Yeah, not just a crocodile, like an alligator. I'm talking like a giant crocodile. Like, <laughs> like, oh my God, like 
big old big old crocodile at uh basically uh at, he's be behind a fence uh with scare basically matches at scarecrow's mercy we have this great intro introductory line like scared you didn't it yeah and bruce is just like hey what's going on here that's what i'd like to know so he's basically interrogating, like, why is this guy kind of trying to move in on his operation? Why is this guy, like, kind of snooping around? Easy, easy. I was just looking for some spare gas. I wasn't trying to move in on your operation. I'm, I'm doing the voice badly, but that's... But still, I mean, the, none of us yeah. really could as well. But, you know, it's, I just love the uh, love undercover uh, Bruce Wayne, as always, and just think him really committing to the part. Like, you know, it matches Mullen pretty much like a Hondo or Naka, just kind of looking for the next, just looking for, for a gig, just looking for... I'm not trying to move in on the operation. Easy, easy, chill. Right. As he pulls so, up it is very Hondo-like, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyways, we have this great jump scare. Uh, so, yeah, we have the jump scare of the giant. The after, after, after that, we have... We, he interrogates matches. Uh, Scarecrow pulls out a gun like, easy, easy. Then he fires the gun. And it's not a bullet, but it's uh, basically we reveal he's been dosed with the new anti-fear gas, as I like to call it. <laughs> so now, then, then we have the great line here. It's the, well, I love the way Jeffrey Combs delivers. It's like the money line of the episode. The way he delivers it. Scared you, didn't I? Yeah. Great. There's a whole like fake out like shooting him and then like scary, but again, it's basically we convey Jeffrey Combs just conveys Scarecrow with a menace and just this fresh new take on the fear gimmick. That's what I love so much about the Scarecrow. Because Tiki's always been fear obsessed, but we always say like, I'm doing fear research. But you know, really, just he's just a guy using fear as an excuse to terrify people. That's kind of what yeah, it's always come much, right? But this is like the first time they've ever truly like done an experiment with the Scarecrow, and that's why I really respect. We actually gave credence to what he's been saying all these years, where. He's actually doing an experiment. Like, what would people? What are, I want people to understand the value of fear. Like I, like I value it. I'm going to show what it's like in a world in a world without fear. No one's asking him to prove this point, but he's doing it anyway. But he's doing it in kind of a, kind of like a turning the you know the world into his guinea pigs. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I just love that we've gave credence and we kind of we turn the whole usual fear thing on its head by taking away the fears. It's just it's I thought it was a genius idea. I think it's the big again Stan Berkowitz just you know big old light bulb, Dini esque light bulb. I love it. Not so frightening now, are they? Matches, he's then climbing, uh, he's basically going after the Scarecrow, uh, and he's just, he's climbing up to the fence and into the, like, the crocodile exhibit, and, uh, and I love the irony, how do you feel about the irony that only, if he only knew who the, that this was Batman, then that ultimately this would be his undoing that's gonna try to kill him later. <laughs> if only he knew, <laughs> the, like, the, the genie he's letting out of the bottle here by, by dosing this guy of all guys, but he's yeah, like, yeah, right. I'm just gonna kill this guy in the career. I'm gonna get him, basically, I'm gonna get him to commit suicide the zoo pretty much right now. So, let's just acknowledge how awesome the idea of Batman going up against alligators is as well. Yeah, do you know if they are? Here's the thing, because I, I just assume crocodiles go to the crocodile. Are they alligators? Are they crocodiles? Do you have any way of knowing? don't have a way of going i just like gators just because gator land <laughs> right so i'm just attached to that well he's not a strong suit kids i'm sorry yeah. anyway um but yes but no you're right though it's the whole batman without batman without fear idea too was just it's it, again we're kind of seeing it just kind of in this in this like oh god is batman being taken under by these crocs and we see the and also we get away with this again on kids wb yet we can get away with all this Especially this episode. We have all this blood in the water just kind of shows up. It's an eerie shot, too. Like, oh, God, he's been... <laughs> we fed him the crocodiles or alligators. Welcome to the food chain. Very dark death trap. How do you most... feel about Batman killing a, killing an alligator dragon? How do you feel about that? Okay, well, okay, two things. One, I mean, it's ambiguous who exactly the blood's coming from because, I mean, he's in tatters. I don't, we don't see the blood. I, we, I assume it's the alligator's blood. I, I think it's a smart money. It's probably the gator's blood. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's a little ambiguous what exactly he does to him, but I, it looks like the other one's not coming back up. Uh, two alligators That's came at him. Say, we literally see a floating dead gator dragon. Well, no, here's the thing. I, I saw, like, you see two go at him. One floats up. The other one doesn't. So I'm assuming the one didn't float up, but you're uh -huh. right. Either or, you're right. One didn't make it, it looks like. I mean, I think animals are like another. Is like, I think the animated Batman, as we saw in the in the Ratio Ghoul episode, he doesn't, he won't kill unless it's necessary for, in regards to animals. Like a panther came at him, he was able to subdue it, so it was fine. 
Uh, Batman doesn't like to kill dogs, but you look at the Dark Knight. I mean, those dogs came at him. He hit them, and they they probably didn't fall on their feet. They probably didn't land on their feet when he hit that dog off the pewter tower of the Dark Knight. So, I mean, I think the animals are different. The, the animal thing doesn't bother me as long as he's not like, going out. I'm going to murder all the animals, then I'm going to get the bad guys. Uh-huh. <laughs> plus, again, not in his right state of mind. So, you know, it was it was survival. It was him or the animals. And plus, it's not like, you know, it's not like the crocodiles are necessarily an endangered species. So, you know, it's... Yeah, fair point. Anyway, point being, any any way, any which way slice it. Yeah, the point being, it's pretty. It's a big moment though. Like, oh god, it's the closest thing Batman gets to killing in the show, though. <laughs> and then we come pretty dang close in uh, in the third act as well. We do that's what I'm saying. We get this episode's really bold and gutsy. And again, on kids WB, how do we get away with this? But I'm not complaining. All right, so uh, yeah, so Tim Drake, he's asking Alfred, like, hey, what's uh, what's taking? What do you think taking Bruce so long? And we just have this great. Uh, you know, Alfred saying investigations take time. Then we just have this this drenched uh, PO uh, Batman, just like Bruce Wayne, just enter like soaking wet as he's kind of emerged from the crocodile pit, just storming through the doors, suit up and get in the plane. Yeah, just very no nonsense. I love in these next two episodes we're going to talk about. We get really ticked off Batman, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's going to make the <laughs> note there. It gets hilarious in the next episode, but this one's pretty. <laughs> This one's pretty intense. Like, suit up and get in a plane. So, again, so, so basically we've established a really interesting premise. Batman, with uh, with fear, uh, you know, without fear, uh, trying to get through it. Batman's always the sort of, like, I'm infected with the thing, but i got to save the day, therefore I can't stop the wounds. He's always, Batman's always playing hurt. In this case, him playing hurt could endanger the safety of the Bat family and others. Yeah, definitely. All right. Okay, yeah. so we're, we kind of get some exposition on the jet about, you know, like, uh, Tim Drake, you know, Tim Drake kind of realizing the dangers of what's going on here. And as we do that, Batman just zooms towards a building, just rockets up the side of it vertically, just kind of all casual, like, you know, as you do. Doesn't even blink an eye at it. Yeah, so also yeah. within the ex. But then the expo would kind of set up the whole a whole city like those two guys from earlier is not going to be good. It's like Robin's like, hey, no fear, cool. Before he realizes, before he realizes it firsthand as well, like, oh god, this is terrifying. As he as he sees with Batman hot dogging in the bat plane, yeah, <laughs> just flying like an a hole. It's like he's always slamming the buildings when he doesn't have to, uh, doing like barrel rolls, as you said. Just oh my god, just uh, terrifying. So basically. <laughs> established tim drake as again his proper role in the bat family these in, in the show he's the audience's perspective he's the audience's kind of intro character he's our pov especially for the kids he's the kids pov into the bat family and the kind of the dynamic here so he's seeing uh, as us the audience are seeing batman in this terrifying state so uh so yeah tim drake's just like oh you didn't you didn't by chance breathe in any of that gas did you yeah but i can handle it <laughs> I mean, yeah, this this episode is just so great. Again, with the Tim Drake roles, it was symbolically we're showing why the Bat family is important with Tim Drake's role in this episode, with him calling him out and this sort of stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. All right, so uh, we return to. Uh, I, I'm sure you. I wonder if you caught this. So we return to the Pan Pacific Auditorium. Yeah. Yeah. Little real life modeling there. Anyway, so we find the canisters are gone, uh, and uh, and uh, the guru and three gunmen are waiting for him as as they as they've shown up. Um, they tell him not to move, but uh, Batman. Oh boy, they picked the wrong night to, to play chicken with Batman. <laughs> just, uh, if I were you, I would move. You're not me. And then Batman's basically doing like kind of the awesome animation. The basically thing they kind of have they had for like the old opening of the, of the, of the show, where basically he would like um, from the pilot animation of the show, where he would dodge the bullets like without. <laughs> basically, they're shooting at him. He's, he's playing chicken with the bullets. He's like dodging him in like you know flourish there. Um, he's throwing batarangs. Like Tim Robin's throwing the batarangs. Uh, where Batman's just playing chicken with the bullets, just going after these guys. Uh, he's, he's, he's doing some really calculated shoves of the thugs. They throw them into each other. Really good action and TMS action, baby. TMS. So let's see. Sure. So that. Yeah. 
So let's see, uh, let's see uh, Batman, eventually he, uh, they, they take out the thugs, Batman grapples the guru's leg for the most ter- one of the most terrifying scenes in the episode. <laughs> so he interrogates the guru, he throws him, he throws him off, off the side of, 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 of the auditorium, or off the side of the office. Uh, what are you going to do, throw me in jail? Batman has a smile and he says this terrifying line before he does all this, it's like, who said anything about jail? With a smile on his face, when Batman's smiling, you run. I don't care who you are, you run. So Batman proceeds to just throw him off the side of the building. Yes, and basically he's like he's fraying the wire. He's fraying the wire, and he's gonna basically as he frays the wire, he's he's with each each line, it's like you'll kill me, man. Death is death. Does it really matter who administers it? That's the line of the episode for me. <laughs> it's just like, oh boy, I did like that. Batman has really gone too far there. That's what I'm saying. Conroy's, I love how all business he is. It's a little like Batman in Return of the Cape Crusaders when we kind of do Adam West without kind of like, you know, kind of like, you know, the 60s kind of morals and the ethics. You know, we're just kind of taking it, like making like Frank Miller Batman full on. And it's just, it, it it's just so terrifying to hear that line come from the Kevin Conroy Batman versus like years later when we do it, just like unironically, like, oh yeah, this Batman's just a psycho killer. We do like a big crisis. Oh, God, don't get me started. Don't get me started. This is when we. This is when yeah, we do go it ahead. right. Go ahead, Dragon. This is when we do it right and gripping. Absolutely, Diggy. Uh-huh. I'm just trying to make points here. Um. Anyways. Right. Okay, so we learned the uh, subway station uh, is uh, is where is where the um, the canister is going to be unleashed on the town using the tunnels. Uh, Batman leaves, but he uh, kind of forgot something. <laughs> Guy left the guru hanging. Line snaps. Uh, Robin panics, saves the guy at the last second. That's a big moment right there. Yeah, like, I, like I said, that is the closest that we pretty much ever see to Batman killing in this show, at least thus far. I don't know if it gets. I can't see how it gets much closer than that throughout the rest of the series. Well, I think uh, there's one moment coming up this season, but uh, you know, it'll be your call if you think that quantifies. Okay. So. We'll get there. I'm like, just saying, Dragon, like, if, if if Tim Drake were not there, that man would be dead. He would. He would. Which, again, <laughs> like, you can imagine like, how gobsmacking it is when you're watching this for the first time. Like, oh, God! Well, yeah, know. Was, that's one thing I was going to ask, Dragon. Like, this, this episode must have traumatized you in some respects. Yeah, yeah. But then we have uh, the MVP Tim Drake scene. Like, the end-all, be-all Tim Drake scene. So, uh... As Batman's walking back to the plane to go stop the subway uh, plan, uh, uh, we batarang and bat rope Batman, and we reveal that Robin has done this. He takes off the belt. Uh, he kind of doesn't doesn't like take it with him because then he'd be leaving it completely defenseless. Kind of like throws it around. Hopefully it'll stay. Um, this is a quintessential thing with Tim Drake. See, the whole point of Tim Drake as a character, both comics and the show, and the whole the whole shebang is that this is the guy who called out Batman when he was reeling after the loss of his previous Robin. Like, he's the one saying, Batman, you, you're going to get sloppy. You need someone in the suit to call you out on your stuff right now, which essentially is what Tim Drake's doing in this situation. Or he's saying, you're out of control. You can't handle this gas. You can't handle the gas. You can't handle the gas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, of course, he, just, he calls it out big time. You're not even afraid to kill, which, again, is very real, very gutsy dilemma uh, for, for Batman on, again, Kids WB. Like, a Batman's not afraid to kill, as we just saw. Yeah, this is an R-rated Snyder Cut Justice League here, folks. <laughs> so let's see. Um, so Robin goes to deal with Scarecrow Soul, and then we have Conroy just kills this scene, man, because you've never seen Batman in a position like this, where Batman... He's manipulative and scary. Yeah, it's basically it's like Batman like like a, like a junkie, pretty much. He's like a junkie for justice. <laughs> It's just, you never see Batman. Robin, you're going to need my help. I know about Scarecrow. Come on. You can take the lead on this one. Don't worry. You'll be the boss on this one. And it's so chilling to see Batman so desperate and manipulative. Where he's kind of yeah, like, yeah. He's like really kind of going into that sort of like surrogate father mode, but for malicious intent. Exactly. And this is everything that Tim Drake wants to hear, by the way. But he just, he just uh, makes uh, it all the more cutting. I mean, he walks, he takes a few steps towards him, and he stops. You know, 
you almost fooled me. Then he walks back. Now we hear just like a really pissed off Batman, just like go untie me. Silly, but in kind of like a lighter kind of way, just like untie me, you little untie me. Untie me, you little untie me. Just like it, it's Conroy, like you've never heard him, Dragon. Absolutely, this is why. Yeah, absolutely, you get Conroy with Andrea Romano is a match made in heaven, kids. This is what gets you performances like this. And uh, and again, shades of uh, of again, kind of the Dick Grayson uh, dilemma. By the way, little shades of deep down, Batman kind of manipulating, potentially manipulating the Bat family when the chips are down, and unconsciously, perhaps. You know. Mm -hmm. All right, so Robin runs into a subway car, and then this is just pure nightmare fuel, Dragon. Like, go, coming upon a subway car and coming upon, like, just Scarecrow delivering the message of just urgent death. You know, just imminent, just imminent bad things. Exactly. So he's filming the little, essentially kind of the ransom demands to the mayor here about, uh, you know, Gotham without fear. Uh, you know, it's, uh, as Batman, meanwhile, all... As this is building up, Batman's like going for the bat knife in his boo. He's freeing himself as like the ticking clock to this scene. Scarecrow's going on. Robin's sneaking aboard. The guys are loading up the gas. Uh, basically, Scarecrow, uh, again, via Combs here, is saying, uh, you know, fear is the glue that holds society together. <clears throat> Suppresses uh, your worst impulses. Fear is power. And again, you, again, he just plays Crane's fascination, the research of the fear so well. He's basically he's ransoming the city for the antidote, because he's going to unleash this thing, but uh, he's going to ransom for the... Basically, he's unleashing a plague that he will then have them pay through the nose to cure. And they and there's nothing they can do to stop it, which is really scary and, and kind of real world in a sense. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not like that has a possibility of happening in this day and age. You know, someone no. may be taking advantage of a cure and ransoming it and people like trying to trying to acquire it and you know the dragon it's not like there's any sort of chance of that happening oh that's just hogwash come on <laughs> god help us folks happy 2021 <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing Scarecrow, he gets his test for his fear and he gets his money it's a win-win for him uh -huh. All right, so then uh, basically, at, right before he wraps up the video, Robin tackles the scarecrow, but then he gets knocked out by by one of the thugs, uh, and then gets cuffed. Uh, you know, they tell him to, the, the, yeah, as Crane tells him, you know, cuff the boy, you know, get you know, uh, get rid of him. You know, uh, his boss is going to be on his way. Uh -huh. All right, so then, uh, so let, let's see, um, Batman. He as the trains as the as the subway car is about to go, Batman hops aboard. Uh, he kicks a goon right off the train. So this is where, I love the mounting tension here because again, we know Batman is not afraid to kill, and this and this subway car is going. He's knocking these guys, and you're, I love how we're clocky and we're showing that okay, these guys are they're, they're alive, probably not well, but they're alive. He's just kind of callously just kind of kicking them and throwing them off this this high speed train right now. But it builds up till we get to the engine room, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like I've used this analogy before with other episodes, but it's a battle for Batman's soul. And it's so scary to see him like this. <laughs> All right, let's see. So, uh, so again, basically, uh, like see, Robin's cuffed to like a railing here, and he's basically pleading to Batman as he as he's um, as he's going up. And by the way, as he uh, he leaves Robin cuffed, and Batman's moving his way forward, you hear like this executioner like music within the score, which is really like Batman is like he's the executioner going for Scarecrow in this scene. It's really twisted on the rewatch. Like, oh my god! Right, right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and again, just the great. Just the great comeuppance for In a Scarecrow. weird way, Dragon Batman is almost kind of like the secondary antagonist of this episode. And Tim Drake, I feel like, is most certainly the primary protagonist of this episode. 100%. Yeah, so it's a really interesting kind of like shake up in the main character dynamics there. So basically, he goes, he mixes up with the Scarecrow. Robin, uh, you know, Robin's trying to talk him down, no dice, as Robin now has to. He has this really awesome karate chop where he, like, you know, like, because he, he sees how close Batman is getting to killing the Scarecrow. And he's like, he, he cuts through, and like, ah, I love the real world acknowledge. Like, that's going to hurt if he just, like, karate chops through those steel handcuffs. <laughs> ain't, a, ain't a board. And of course, like, uh, Scarecrow says, uh, basically, as Batman's getting into a fight with Scarecrow, he knocked him in the controls. The train's now going at ridiculously high speeds, and Scarecrow says, you're going to get us killed. 
what are you doing trying to scare me so oh, this is this is not good so robin springs into action batman begins choking the life out of the scarecrow as robin is pleading with him to stop batman like backhands robin like oh god not robin no he's in robin <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> so it, it, the buck really falls to Robin to save the day here. So he's racing to get the antidote before Batman breaks his b- breaks his big rule here. He, he crosses the line. He's never going to come back from and forgive himself from. I love the comeuppance on the Scarecrow though. Of like he gasped Bruce Wayne and now Batman's trying to kill him. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's it's definitely like the making your own monster scenario. Again, Scarecrow again, almost getting again the 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 timing again, so scary, like suffocation on the kids' TVs, just like you hear like almost like the bones crunching and everything. He's like, oh, his, you get you hear the intensity of it, like like wrapping his hands around the guy's neck, and he's like <gasps> his creepy little like kind of leather face thing, just like like there's no human behind that mask anymore, but like going, <gasps> just you know kind of suffocating. Uh, Robin, you know, hits him with the antidote, little kind of a um, uh, little inhaler thing. Uh, Batman kind of comes to his senses, but the train's speeding, and basically it's going to fall into like a giant, like unbuilt bridge area, which is not good. So uh, basically, the plan is okay. We got to jump. Uh, this, what about Scarecrow? I'll take care of him. We have this great, this great gag. It's like I'll take care of him. Robin's kind of looks at him. I'll get him off the train. Like, no, I'm not going to kill him. I'm going to get him off the you train. You know what? Honestly, I did think that. I, I didn't really think of that moment as a gag. I thought of that as like a. You know, like a great kind of like, all right, they're coming to terms. They're working together, man. Like, there's the understanding Robin was looking for. True, true. But I love that now Batman, where that was never in question before, now Batman has to make a point of saying that. Right. Now, like, oh, well, I just got to choose his wording carefully, given what's just happened. <laughs> but he gets it, though. He's made, being very precise. So Robin makes the jump. Batman leaps with the scarecrow. Again, I love how he timed it to the last minute to, to go over the cliff there. So, like, just at just the last minute. So, because again, they're going really high speeds there. So, uh, then uh, we have our ending. Our ending is really nice. So, uh, we had a rare daytime scene. Yeah. The ending is basically just kind of like a moral, you know, it's just a very, very quick aside. Like, hey, sometimes a little fear is a good thing. Yeah. And also the whole uh, Robin kind of apologizing for tying him up. This is like, don't apologize. You were right. But yeah, giving Robin some like, yeah, you did good, kid. You kind of give him the closest thing to Batman, giving him a pat on the head, you know, just like the mean Joe Green coking a smile moment. They're walking into the sunset. Little fear is a good thing. Um, <laughs> and they're walking off in the sun. It's, it's quite nice. All right. After such a scary episode, we, nice to end on a happy note. Yeah, so final thoughts, Dragon. Uh, I think this is like easily the best episode of the of season four so far. And I, I really do think it stands up with some of the better episodes of the first three seasons as well. I mean, it's not a per chance to dream by any means, but not very few episodes are. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I, I was really impressed by this one. It, it really, I think it's by far the best of the Scarecrow episodes, in my opinion. And it just has a really solid pace to it. The, like I said, the first act feels like it's got like a lot of fun, kind of like comedy to it. The second act is a nice sort of like Bruce Wayne, Tim Drake mystery adventure. And then the third act is like the battle for Batman's soul. And I really feel like it, uh, it elevates things very well. It's got a great pace to it. Very memorable moments and quotes, very great, you know, very memorable Conroy delivery on some of those moments. So, uh, so yeah, overall I can't complain. Just a, just an all around incredibly solid episode. Uh, final thoughts for me. Uh, I concur. Great episode. Brilliant take on the Scarecrow's fear obsession. Uh, again, I love the, um, I love highlighting the fear in relation to Batman, which of course you know, we do kind of by the fearlessness, uh, the storytelling. Uh, just such a it's, a, it's a left turn that works like a dream. Like, okay, instead of just Batman being afraid of something, what if he wasn't afraid of something? It's like it's a great left turn, <laughs> you know. Uh, again, one of the best Tim Drake episodes. Uh, Again, ultimately, uh, the new adventures. Uh, you, the new adventures ultimately they kind of get one shot at these revamps for a lot of these characters. A lot of these characters don't get set, with the exception of like a Joker, for example. These uh-huh. characters don't get a second bite of the apple traditionally. Like if you see the Scarecrow again, I'll be in a smaller role, mind you. But that's something you don't get like a Scarecrow episode again in New Adventures. 
So in making each shot count, I feel that, you know they really they really made it sing on this one. They knew like we're probably going to have one shot and kind of planning out their episodes for the most part. Like if we put it, we're not going to give them like a full on episode like we could do in the animated series days. We can't can't quite do that again. So they took the they took the full potential of their new playground. Like now somehow on this network we're able to go a little further. So let's make the most of that, but let's not go gratuitous. Let's make it make it a good story. And, uh, and we did. It's definitely one of the standouts, and I absolutely concur. So far, it's the, it's the best of the bunch. So far. All right. Cool. Take us out. <clears throat> the Clown Prince of Crime. A Millionaire. Crime Pays. The Batman. Unhappy. Will Living Well Keep the Joker Out of Trouble? In this, de- in this demented reform tale... Will the mob let this stand? Tune in next time to find out. Same animated bat time, same animated bat place. On the next visit to the animated bat cave with Joker's Millions. Tag, you're it. I'm in the phone book, baby.